welcome back for part three of the uh, Safety and Cybersecurity at Home 101 series. Uh, it's good to see you again, sort of. Um, we're going to get started. Uh, Ryan's with me. Ryan, you want to say hi? I do. Hey, everybody. Glad to have you back again. I'm excited. <laughs> it's, been a, it's been a great day so far. Right. Middle of the week. Uh, I can only imagine. All right, so welcome back. Uh, quick recap of part one and two, and then we'll dig into part three. Uh, we've got plenty of time, not a ton of content to cover uh, today, but we're still going to get through our three topics and then uh, move on to Thursday. So quick recap of part one and two. Uh, in part one, the safety and cybersecurity issues at home, we talked about our problem. Uh, and our problem is more complexity, more technology, uh, unfortunately, many of us aren't using that technology safely. And so what we're doing is just increasing uh, risk, increasing risk to safety, cybersecurity at home uh, for ourselves and, and for our family members. So our children, our spouses, uh, our loved ones, at the end of the day, they end up suffering for it. Uh, the solution, education and simplification. And then we introduced you to S2Me on Monday. Yesterday, uh, Ryan did a great job taking us through uh, starting the S2Me assessment. We logged in. We're going to do that again. And I know it seems maybe a little basic, uh, but different people are in different places when it comes to technology, when it comes to uh, using websites, using applications. So uh, we'll get through that. We're also going to, uh, yesterday, Ryan also talked about household desktop and laptop use safe practices for internet usage and choosing and protecting authentication. The truth again, and I'll say the same stuff over and over again, nobody is responsible for your safety or your cybersecurity like you are. Uh, at the end of the day, it all falls on, on you. Uh, you will not be sold anything. That's also a truth and complexity is the enemy of information security. So whenever you have the opportunity to make things simpler, do it. Uh, at least from a security perspective. So today, part three, we're going to continue on. Uh, we're going to talk about mobile devices. Uh, everybody seems to have one nowadays, even the, the younger generations, uh, even eight years old. If you remember back in uh, part one, 20% of children eight years old already have mobile devices. So securing those things is, is very important. We'll talk about securing Wi-Fi uh, and then securing our gateway. Sometimes people call this uh, their firewall. Same sort of thing, uh, and we'll get into all that stuff too. A lot to cover. Uh, again, th this session uh, is being recorded. We posted two uh, previous sessions on YouTube uh, earlier today. Uh, if you missed it or you want to share it, whatever you want to do with those, uh, they're out there. Uh, we're live streaming to Facebook today. If you do miss a session or you have questions, we've received some emails, which is great. Uh, send them our way and uh, we'll answer questions. You know, we're here to serve. All right, so logging into S2Me, again, https colon slash slash s2me.io. Uh, again, I apologize in advance for the repetition, but we need to make sure that we get sort of everybody involved in this. Signing in. Top right, you'll see in that s2me.io website, you'll see uh, sign up and sign in. You're gonna choose the sign in link. And then you'll get this, you'll get uh, a sign in page. Type your email address in the field labeled email and type your password in the field labeled password. Now, if you chose to do two-factor SMS authentication, uh, you'll see another screen. If you forgot your password, click that. Uh, it's a simple process, two, three steps, and you'll get uh, get a password. Um, it'll go to your email, so you'll have to check your email and have access to your email to, to go ahead and reset that password. Uh, and then click the sign in button, and that's it. Again, if you had the two-factor authentication, you'll see this screen. Uh, so you'll need to have your mobile device, your phone ready, whatever you typed in for your, your phone number. Uh, you'll get a six-digit code. You'll enter that six-digit code into the authentication code field uh, and then click the submit button if you wanted to you could click the the trust this device for two weeks uh, i wouldn't suggest it if you're using a shared system 
but if, you, if the system you're using is only going to be used by you, feel free. It's a, it's a convenience uh, where you can trust the device for two weeks and not have to go through the whole uh, two-step authentication piece anyway. All right, and then you'll get here. And this is uh, your portal, your dashboard. It won't look like this if you've been following, around, following along so far. Um, it'll look like this. So we're at 30% complete. We've done the first three of 10 topics. Uh, yeah, and you can see that bottom right or bottom left or top right, I'm sorry. 30% complete, bottom left. Uh, you'll see the done, the checkbox. If you don't see that, you still have questions to answer there. Uh, and if you wanna go back and change things, you can go here. I just click the uh, see your answers. Because sometimes what, what you'll do, at least in this version of S2Me, um, you may have taken some of the recommendations and made some changes and want to see how that affects your score. Not everything here is uh, weighted the same way. So certain things that you do within the S2Me will have a greater impact on security than other things. Uh, so sometimes it's interesting to see as you remediate things uh, what your new score is. And this is where you'd go to do that. All right, so part three, we're starting with mobile devices. Scroll down the page. If you're on this page here, scroll down and you'll see these. And we're gonna go through all three of these today. We'll go through topic four, five, and six. Just click the complete topic four, and that'll bring you into this. This all looks very familiar to what we saw yesterday. Uh, and it, it works the same way. We'll start usually with a top level question on whether you're even using this technology. Uh, if you're not using the technology, then we won't ask you any questions about it. Uh, if you are using, then you'll see more. In most cases, you'll see that you are using these technologies. So most, yes, no, not sure. Uh, and feel free to answer not sure. Don't feel guilty if you're not sure about something. If anything, it should be uh, uh, maybe a, a prompt that you should go and, and see see what the answer is for these things. Maybe ask a family member. Uh, if you have a technical person uh, you know that you know, maybe ask them. You can certainly ask us, and we can steer you in the right direction. Uh, the goal would be all those not sures at some point to get those to a yes or a no. Uh, one of the things with security is the better you know your systems, the better you know yourself. Um, also, the more secure you can be. Uh, so get intimate with, you know, all the systems and devices and technologies that you're using. It just makes it more secure. And you'll find that you'll probably find some features in some of these things that you didn't even know existed. All right, so if you answer no to this question, you'll get an 850 for this topic and you'll just move on to topic four or topic five. Uh, in most cases, you're going to be answering yes. Uh, so that we can calculate what your S2 score is. This is going all the way back to session one or part one. Uh, this is a stat that we used. And really the point here is the things that we're asking in the S2Me are all relevant. Um, in this case, 4.18 billion users of mobile devices um, and using the internet. So those two combined. You can see most people, almost everybody, uh, is using a mobile device in, in the United States anyway. All right, so you choose yes. You'll see then uh, a bunch of questions up here that you'll need to go through. The first one, question 4.2, my mobile devices, laptop, iPhone, iPad, Android, are all secured with authentication, a hard to guess passcode, a strong password, uh, or a biometric. Uh, using a mobile device, now the one thing uh, with authentication in this case, if I have really solid physical security around something, I lessen the need for authentication. Mobile devices are even more prone to risk without authentication because we lose them. Uh, they're easily stolen, they're easily taken from us. So it's easy to lose physical control of these devices. Therefore, authentication becomes really, really important. If an attacker or a thief were to steal your phone, with authentication, it makes it a little more likely they're not gonna get into it. So 
authentication is really, really important in mobile devices, even more so than uh, in desktop computers. They're important in both, but certainly more here. My mobile devices are all encrypted. This is the same sort of thing. The rule of thumb around encryption is anything that I don't have physical control of or lose phys physical control of should be encrypted. Uh, that would be, you know, laptops, mobile devices, a little less so on desktops because you usually have physical control or you can put physical controls around those. Um, same with network media. So you've seen those network cables before that go from the back of your computer, maybe in a desktop, into the wall. You sort of have physical control of, of that physical media, but you don't have physical control outside of your home. So when you get, get on the other side of that router that we're going to talk about in topic uh, six, uh, you no longer have physical control of the, of the cables or the media. That's why one of the reasons why encryption is really, really important outside of the home. Hopefully that makes sense. But in this case, uh, all my mobile devices are encrypted. Very important. I do not allow others to use my mobile devices, including family members and friends. Uh, the reason this is you don't know how other people I don't know how other people are using my systems. If I let my daughter or uh, my wife use uh, maybe my iPad or my iPhone, um, I, unless I have other controls in place, it's more likely that they might install something uh, on my um, mobile device that I didn't know of, I didn't know about it. And so as I'm using it, I may be opening up other uh, avenues of attack that I didn't, didn't realize. Uh, or, or in my case, when I let my wife use the iPad, I uh, wind up with a really large bill for Target and Amazon. Well, there's that too. Absolutely. And you can put other controls in place. So if this was something that was really necessary in your home, maybe you, uh, and some, some people can't afford multiple mobile devices, so they share them. If that's the case, then you'll just have another, a whole bunch of other mitigating controls that you'll put in place. In general, you don't want uh, family members sharing mobile devices. Uh, question four or five, I've set up remote wipe capabilities on my mobile device so I can erase them if they're lost or stolen. All these sort of play together. So if something is encrypted and secured with authentication, because your, your authentication oftentimes in a mobile device is the key that unlocks the encryption that makes it usable for you, so if 4.2 and 4.4 uh, aren't in place, then 4.5 becomes even more important. Uh, so if I lose my mobile device and I'm aware of it, uh, in Apple, you can go you know, into your uh, account and just remote wipe uh, that device. That's a nice capability to have. Uh, if, the, if your mobile device is encrypted and authenticated, it's a little less important, uh, but it still gives you some peace of mind that you've wiped it. So those are those four questions. Hopefully they make sense to everyone. If you have questions, feel free to at, uh, ask them uh, in the webinar. Ryan's here to answer questions. And if I see them, you know, I'll address it too. All right, so let's move on to the next four questions, four, six. I make sure to install a, all security updates and patches immediately for all devices and applications. Every single application, uh, including operating systems, applications that run on top of operating systems, anything that's been developed with code will be patched at some point. Uh, it, there's just so much complexity in, uh, in, in development of, uh, of a lot of applications. And developers make mistakes just like everybody else. Um, so there's a good chance that you'll have bugs. A bug is just a, an error. Uh, within the application, vulnerabilities within those applications. Really important to install updates right away. Uh, some updates you install may not have security components to it, but it's still a good idea to update them. Uh, so it's important. I turn off Bluetooth when it's not needed. Bluetooth is pretty a pretty insecure protocol. It's a very convenient protocol. It's a very lightweight protocol. Uh, gives me the ability to you know, play uh, music on an external speaker. It gives me the ability to use a, uh, an Apple watch. Uh, gives me the ability to connect up into my car. Uh, that's all Bluetooth. 
um, the thing with Bluetooth, it's within the 100 feet, uh, attackers can oftentimes see that you have Bluetooth on uh, and then attempt to attack it. So it's a good idea to turn Bluetooth off if you're not using it. For some of us, it's just not possible. Like I answer, uh, for this one, I answer false uh, because I have, an, I have an Apple Watch. So my Bluetooth is always on. Um, so I have to put other mitigating controls in place or just pay attention to what's connecting uh, to my, my iPhone. Uh, but in general, we'd, we'd want to answer true to that. Uh, at least be aware that, uh, of how you can do that. Question 4.8, I have disabled automatic uh, joining of Wi-Fi networks. This is a big one. Um, oftentimes, uh, mobile devices, depending on the mobile device, depending on the, the version uh, of the software that's running, um, an attacker can sometimes trick you into connecting to a Wi-Fi access point that they control uh, just as simple as using the same name of a common uh, access point. So if you, let's say you're at Starbucks and um, you have automatic Wi-Fi joining turned on for the Starbucks and an attacker takes uh, another access point, puts it in closer proximity to you where the, there's probably a stronger signal uh, and names the access point the same name as the Starbucks access point you're going to connect to him or her instead of Starbucks. Uh, that's one of the reasons why this is really popular for people that travel. You want to turn this off uh, because in airports, there's usually so much Wi-Fi traffic. Uh, it's pretty easy to trick somebody into connecting to you as an attacker versus, a, you know, somebody legitimate. So that's a big one. You should turn that one off. Uh, but, and if you're not sure, then answer, not sure. Uh, Depending on your mobile device, if you're talking, you know, iOS for an Apple uh, versus Android or uh, another, um, pretty easy to find that stuff, and we can we can certainly help you do that. Question 4.9: Whenever I conduct business and/or perform sensitive transactions over a public Wi-Fi network, I do so only through a VPN. So VPN, for people who don't know, is a virtual private network. It's a tunnel. There's two components to a VPN. One is a tunnel, which is a point-to-point -point connection. It's a virtual connection. Uh, the second part is encryption. The encryption part is really, really important because an attacker uh, could potentially put themselves in the middle of your communication, certainly with Wi-Fi, uh, because Wi-Fi is broadcast. It's, uh, it's in the airwaves. I don't have to plug into a, a network cable or anything. Um, you want that data to be encrypted, certainly any sensitive information. Otherwise, it's uh, prone to interception uh, and sometimes prone to interception and manipulation, meaning the attacker could change the data, put it back uh, on the wire and uh, get you. You think you're doing the right things, but actually you're not because the attacker is controlling the traffic. So that's also important. Tons of good VPN products out there. Um, some of them are free. Uh, be careful though, which VPN products you, you do purchase. There's a whole slew of them that come from China. And I'm just one of those people that I don't trust uh, a lot of my software um, from overseas. So just be careful which product you're choosing. NordVPN is one uh, that's probably one of the most popular. All right. So on to uh, question 410, when I dispose of a device, I take it to a secure recycling center to ensure my data is destroyed. This is another one that honestly, I, I, I had to choose false on this. I don't do that. Uh, it's a good best practice to do that. There's risk involved. And the reason being, uh, there's residual data. So even sometimes when I reset the device, which is on question 4.11, uh, if I reset the device, there's still data on the device, depending on what the reset function uh, was. Um, so the best bet, if you really want to make sure that nobody gets to your data on a mobile device when you're done with it, uh, take it to a secure recycling center where they'll physically destroy it for you. Um, that's the only way to really be 100% certain that, uh, that you're not going to get data off it is to physically destroy it. 
a lot of recycling centers, uh, they're all over the place. Um, uh, and what they'll do is they'll shred it um, and give you, oftentimes they'll give you a receipt saying they shred it, shredded it too. So that's 4.10. I answered false. Some of you may actually do that. Then you'd answer true. Uh, 4.11, if I sell or trade in a device, I reset the device to factory settings and remove all personal data first. Absolutely uh, something you'd want to do. Uh, when you give, if you're going to sell a device or trade it in, if you trade it in, they're going to resell it, right? So, so one way or another, it's going to end up in somebody else's hands. They're not going to take a device that is locked, right? I mean, you're going to have, probably have to remove your authentication, uh, which then removes the encryption, which then removes all your protection, right? So, uh, resetting the fa resetting the device to factory settings is is fairly simple to do and uh, definitely a good good best practice. 4.12, this question is specific to Android devices. Uh, Android devices have a little more risk involved. Just to, when you look at an Android device versus a, an iOS device, and I know that the geeky people uh, out there, you can lock it down. And I'm not saying that, um, that you can't secure them both, but in general, Android devices are more uh, prone to uh, more prone to malware, more prone to attack, more prone to ransomware. It's just a more open operating system and a more open um, ecosystem. It's difficult for an attacker to get bad software through the Apple store and onto your iOS device. A little easier on Google. Yeah, the, the way I like to think about it is uh, security on Apple devices is easier and security on Android devices is harder. There are more steps to go through uh, to achieve the same level of security. You can do it, but it is, it's hard work. So if, you're, if you love convenience, I would point you towards uh, Apple devices, but if you like to have that flexibility or you're a super geek, um, you know, myself, I run Android and Evan, he runs an iPhone. So it tells you a little bit about us from a personality perspective too. Yeah, that's definitely true. I'm a, well, I'm a simple guy. I have enough complexity in my life as it is. Uh, I don't, I spend enough time doing other things that uh, I enjoy the, I guess the simpler and more convenient, you know, I do miss out on some cool things that you can do with an Android that you can't do with an iPhone. Uh, but it's, you know, tomato, tomato, potato, potato. It's, it's uh, you know, what your preference is. But if you do answer yes to this, you'll see another question come up and it's just, one simple question, are you running antivirus, anti-malware software with automatic updates? We could ask a whole bunch more questions about Android if we wanted to here, uh, but that's the one most significant risk is getting malicious software onto that device. Uh, so that's the only additional question you get uh, in topic four. And if you think that, you know, if you are an Android user and you think that we should be asking more questions, you have other really significant risks that you think we should account for in the S2Me, tell us. Um, like I've said, you know, numerous times in the series so far, we don't pretend to know everything. Uh, and so this is meant to be a free tool that we make available to the community. You know, we're also hoping that the community will give us feedback with it. So that's it for securing mobile devices. Pretty painless, I think, uh, and we'll move on. So I'm going to give it just a couple of qu couple of seconds. You know, Ryan, are you all caught up on any questions that we've got? Yep, I've been firing through. Um, and if you guys read, I've been putting some links in there as well. So there's some links on how to wipe an iPhone remotely, how to wipe an Android remotely. Um, those will be helpful to you if you're unfamiliar on how to do that today. Awesome. All right, so we'll move on. Several ways to find the next topic, you know, in the S2Me tool, uh, where we're going to end up is in securing Wi-Fi. Uh, it's pretty self-explanatory in, in finding your way through uh, S2Me on purpose, right? We, uh, the, the challenge is you have some people on one side of the spectrum that are very, like, very geeky, um, and I don't mean that in a bad way, uh, and then you have others who, you know, like my mother, uh, you, you sort of have to walk it slower, um, so 
that's why we made the tool really sort of easy to, to navigate through. Uh, topic five, securing Wi-Fi. So the first question, again, just like all the other topics, is do you even have Wi-Fi? Do you have a Wi-Fi network that you're responsible for? If, you're, if you don't, again, no questions about it. If you do, well, then let's ask about, you know, ask some things. So no, yes, for our intents and purposes, it's going to be yes. Uh, most people do uh, have Wi-Fi networks at home. Uh, not to the degree that, uh, you know, some of the other stats that we shared earlier, um, there's less people using Wi-Fi than using the internet, you know, for instance, uh, but Wi-Fi is still very, very popular and gaining in popularity. If you remember back to uh, our very first uh, uh, session or part, part one, uh, 110 million households with broadband connectivity, 89% of those households uh, have also have Wi-Fi. Uh, so the point is it's relevant. So question 5.2, I answered yes, questions expand. Uh, I have changed the default passwords on all home network uh, equipment and strong two strong passwords. St uh, the rule of thumb with passwords is, because I know there's tons of different password guidance and it gets really confusing for some people, myself included, I guess. Uh, the rule is long is strong. So you can drop complexity. Uh, complexity isn't as important as length. So if you were just to, to type a passphrase, um, you know, whatever comes to mind, a sentence maybe, type that sentence out. That's much stronger than some super complex 12 character password. Long is strong. Uh, so when you are changing, you know, default passwords to strong passwords, now some applications restrict the length of a password, which is frustrating. The reason why developers often restrict length in a password field is because if I don't, oftentimes I'd open myself up to other bugs like a SQL injection attack, uh, other things like that. So you have to put some limit on the length, uh, but hopefully that most of the things we're using are long. They, get, they let us do long passwords. So anyway, uh, default passwords, the reason why this is so important is most of the routers, most of the network devices that we use are commercial network devices. Most of us didn't build them in the garage. Uh, that means that they're popular. Uh, they all come with some default authentication uh, attached to them. Uh, I know it, you know it, the attackers also know it. So we make their job really, really easy if we're protecting something with a default password. Uh, because those things are published. You can do some Google searches and find all the default passwords for just about everything. Uh, so really important. Um, and I think what most people do at home, if, if you're like your ISP set these things up for you, uh, they set it up, it works, you forget about it, right? It's done, it, it's working. I don't have any issues. Um, sometimes they'll leave behind like a, a piece of paper or a sticker or something that has the password written on it. Uh, take a look at that and uh, and see what it is. Is it is it long enough for you? Does it feel like it's long enough? Does it feel like it's secure enough? Uh, if they didn't give you anything, maybe it's a, and they're the ones who set it up. Maybe it's a good idea to call them uh, and find out what it is so that you can reset it to something longer. Um, whatever. So those default passwords change them on everything. You should never run a default password on anything. Uh, question 5.3, all my wireless network equipment is provided by reputable suppliers, and I have validated this through my own research. Uh, this is kind of a subjective question, so it's, and it's sort of meant to be that. What we want people to do with this is to actually research, to actually go, you know, find out what model number you have on your whatever device, say it's your, uh, your firewall or your Wi-Fi access point, or maybe they're combined, Look on the bottom of it and you'll see, oftentimes you'll see a model number, a manufacturer a model number and a serial number. Uh, Google that, look it up. Uh, see what other people are saying about your equipment that you're using and that you're trusting. Uh, if you see that, if you can't find anything when you Google that stuff, well then that might be cause for concern. Uh, one, will it be supported uh, if something goes wrong? Are they still doing software updates for this thing? Um, that's all kind of important. 
Uh, it's also good to look at other people's reviews. If it is a popular uh, system, um, what are other people saying about it? What frustrations do they have? Have they been hacked? Uh, all those things kind of in 5.3, if you're not sure, which most people won't be, I, you know, I certainly understand that. Uh, go and do some research. That's, that's kind of the point. Well, it's interesting you bring that up, Evan. The conversation I just had on my couch last night with my wife is um, Samsung is discontinuing support and security patches for the S7 phone, which is what she's got. And so, of course, I joyfully said, yay, I get an upgrade. Uh, <laughs> and she, she wasn't too keen on that. But the reality is, is I'm not going to allow in my house a unsupported device. And that's, that's how I'm managing that risk. Yeah, good idea. Absolutely. All right. So question five, four, I check my home network equipment for security updates regularly, no less than once a month. Um, everything that's been developed, uh, it's developed by human beings and human beings make mistakes. Uh, we have errors. We, I would say anything over five, 10 lines of code, which is really nothing, probably has an error in it, you know, because it starts as the code gets more and more complex. Uh, it's harder and harder to secure it. Uh, so in, you know, a typical piece of network equipment, depending on what all the functions that it does, there may be 10, 20, 100, couple hundred thousand lines of code, which is code is what the programmer wrote in the program to tell the device to do what it does. The thing with computers and the thing with network, things with network equipment, they only do what we told them to do. Uh, so if we told it to do an error, it's going to do an error. Uh, if we told it to, you know, hopefully that makes sense. So when manufacturers become aware of a vulnerability or a bug or whatever in their network equipment, the reputable ones will patch it, right? They'll issue a software update. Um, you'll need to, oftentimes you'll need to go into your network equipment and download that update and apply it. Uh, in some cases, it's rare, but in other cases, there's automatic updates. So go and check to see if those are turned on. Uh, some of those vulnerabilities can be really severe. I know the Chinese were attacking Linksys routers last year um, in mass. Um, so do that. And once a month is a, a good idea. I configured my wireless network settings to use the strongest encryption available uh, in, in uh, you know, the products we use, that'd be WPA2. Uh, certainly don't want to use WEP. Uh, WEP is an old encryption, WEP, old encryption protocol, uh, very, very easily uh, broken. So just check, just to make sure. Uh, and you don't even have to go into your wireless network uh, device to find that out. It, you can look at one of the things that you're using to connect to it. Uh, but just make sure it's using WPA2. Uh, I configured my wireless network settings to use the strongest encryption available. I already talked about that one, five, six, my SSID. The SSID is when you open your Wi-Fi uh, settings and you see all the access points that you can connect to, that name that's, that's there, that's called the SSID, the service set identifier. You can configure that to be uh, really all sorts of things. What we don't want here is for you to configure it like my last name is Francine. I wouldn't, I don't want to set up my Wi-Fi, my SSID as Francine home because then everybody knows, right? Anybody who drives by, however, you know, I guess powerful the signal is out of my Wi-Fi device, we call that bleed. Um, you know, it's just, it's not, it's a safety issue. People know what network belongs to me. Uh, eventually they'll attack it potentially. So just change it to something that doesn't give any indication of its location, any indication of personal information. Now in companies, they often do this. They often set it up as an identifier for that company. That's different than at home. Uh, companies have other things, other mitigating controls in place. They have additional budget, things like that, that oftentimes we don't have at home. Uh, so don't set your SSID as something that uh, identifies you. Question five, seven, connections to my Wi-Fi is R secured with a strong password. This is not the connection, or this is not to get into the device. This is to connect to the network. Um, 
you'd want it to be strong. If you if you have the ability to do multi-factor authentication, meaning you have a device that supports it and you feel comfortable setting it up, that's even better. Uh, but a strong password is often sufficient. The thing with the hacking Wi-Fi networks is the attacker has to have pretty close proximity to your home or to wherever your access point is. So it's not like, um, you know, somebody in Russia can attack your, you know, attack to get on your Wi-Fi network from Russia. He would have to come to your neighborhood, probably sit in your backyard to do that. So what we're trying to do is just make it strong enough to where um, it's not easy for people to get in. So multi-factor authentication might be overkill, but if you're doing it, great. Uh, a strong password is often sufficient and definitely not the default again. So two different passwords I was talking about. The one I was talking about before is the password to get into and manage the network device. This password is the password to connect to your network. Uh, so true, false, not sure. Go ahead and enter that. Uh, question 8.5.8, .8, wireless network passwords have been changed within the last 12 months. Passwords do age. Uh, it, it, I know there's been a lot of guidance around this and NIST didn't do us. NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. They didn't do us any real favors last year when they uh, issued some guidance on password management and said, we well, never need to change your password. Um, it's still a good idea to change your password. The reason being uh, a password and given enough time, any password can be cracked. It's just, it's a function of time and computing power. Uh, how many calculations can the computer do within a certain period of time, give it enough time and enough power, it'll eventually crack the password. In some cases with current, um, you know, current computing power, it might be hundreds of thousands of years if you chose a strong enough password. But as computing power continues to get stronger and stronger, that number becomes smaller and smaller. That's one reason. Another reason why we want passwords to be changed regularly is I, I tell other people about them or I write them down or somehow I disclosed it and I didn't intend to, or maybe I did intend to. When you do that, it's like you told somebody else about it and they promise not to tell anybody, but you know, people are people that probably will tell somebody else or you'll tell somebody else. It, the word gets out over time. So that's the other reason why we want passwords changed. Uh, it's simple to do, just do it. And then 5.9, this one's pretty uncommon. I know people who have done this, I do this, uh, create a separate wireless network for guests and one for visitors. If you're really ambitious, you can create different wireless networks for different types of systems in your house. So uh, some people will create a wireless network only for uh, gaming, another Wi-Fi network only for business and another one for entertainment and another one for IOT. You can get really complex with this. This, this question is really only about really the most significant risk with Wi-Fi segmentation. Do I have a separate guest network than from my home, you know, personal network? The reason this is important is because if I tell people my password to get onto my network, I've told people how to get onto my network. If they're only able to get into the guest network, um, I can restrict uh, potentially what they have access to on my home network. Um, I can also change that password you know, more regularly. Uh, so having a different network for your guests is, a, is always a good idea. Uh, so true, false, not sure, and that's that. Boom. That's, uh, that's me being excited. I, I might have told you before that the face I have it is my excited face. It's also my really uh, panicky face. It's the same face, but there's my boom for you. Uh, that's it for that topic. And uh, at this point in the S2Me assessment, we are 50% complete. Uh, it's kind of cool. And I've said it before, and I think we say it at the end uh, of each one of these parts or each one of these sessions, that um, the entire assessment from beginning to end, if you know the answers to a lot of these questions you're, for yourself, it, it should take you no longer than 10 to 15 minutes to get through the entire assessment. 
we're taking a long time to get through it because we're explaining it as we go. Uh, for people who aren't really familiar with all the technology that they use or how they're using it, it it'll take them longer. Um, and that's, it's good that it takes them longer. I don't want them to give up uh, because they need to go find answers to these questions. It's important for them to know. Uh, so anyway, having said that, we'll move on. Next topic is, uh, well, that's not right. It's actually topic seven, securing your gateway, or six, I'm sorry, securing your gateway. So first one, again, we've seen it. Uh, do you maintain your own personal or home network? If you don't, move on. If you do, which most of us do, then we'll have more questions again. Same stats sort of apply here. Most households do have a home network. They have some networking capability. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't see all the TVs calling home to internet and refrigerators that order milk when I'm out of milk and dishwashers who, you know, alert me while I'm on vacation that my laundry's done. Uh, all that stuff requires a network. So most of us have that. All right, question six, two, then. There's a firewall between my personal and our home networks and all others, including the internet. Don't try to read too much into this question. There's all kinds of different types of firewalls and all kinds of different functions of a firewall. Really what a firewall does is it stands between your home network or your, your trusted network and an untrusted network, the internet. Uh, it sits there and it monitors traffic, right? And it makes decisions on what, a traf what traffic it's going to allow and not allow based on whatever rules have been set up. You don't have to get really detailed into the rules of your router, of your firewall. This first question is just, do you have one? Uh, if you're not sure, ask somebody. Uh, it can get pretty technical when you start getting into firewalling and all the different um, methods you can use. This is the start. Uh, you can, we can get more detailed later. Again, there's our default password again. Uh, I've changed the default password. Uh, including on my firewall or secure gateway to a strong password. Strong is long, long is strong. Um, uh, most of us, not most of us, but many of us have our access point, our Wi-Fi um, access point, our router and our firewall all in one box, little box. Uh, so your answer to, you know, in the previous topic, it, you know, might be the same answer here, but if you have separate devices, it might be different. Question 6.4, I ensure that all network equipment, including the firewall secure gateway is checked for software updates. The same thing applies that we were talking about with Wi-Fi. Uh, it's written, but it's got code. It's running on code. Uh, code has bugs. You can check regularly to make sure it's up to date. All right, six five. I ensure the firewall settings and rules are reviewed at least quarterly. This might require, you know, some some reading up, uh, or you might, you know, want to, uh, you know, ask somebody to help you. That's that's all fine. Uh, but there are the reason why this is important because people change things. Things get changed, uh, and if you're not aware of the changes that have been made, I've done this myself. Um, I've made changes to things because I was testing something. Uh, and then I forgot that I made that change uh, until a while later. Uh, and, you know, I, I haven't been hacked because of it, but it uh, it's certainly surprising that certain traffic that I didn't expect to be open on my network was open. Uh, and then it's trying to remember, why the heck did that happen? If you're checking your systems and your settings uh, regularly, it's less, less likely that that's going to happen. Um, so good idea. Most people, I think it's going to be false and that's just fine. Uh, maybe it's something to consider um, you know, in the future. Question 6.6, six, I access and manage all network equipment using a secure protocol or via a secure protocol. What makes a protocol secure is one, it's up to date. It's, it's not an old protocol. Um, and this, gets, this can get geeky too, I get that. Um, and it's also encrypted, right, from here to there. In a home network, it's not super critical uh, to have that, uh, to have it be encrypted because chances are pretty good that the attacker is not nearby or in your house. And um, unless you're, you know, potentially, unless you're managing network equipment remotely, I guess there's that, then it's, 
it's a, probably a bigger deal. Um, but secure protocols, the ones that you see there, we list them off. Just, and, and sometimes we just assume that people know this language. Uh, HTTPS is the same HTTPS that, you, that we tell you all the time uh, when you're visiting a website, same protocol. It just, it, it's an encrypted uh, protocol. Um, HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Uh, the S means secure. TLS is Transport Layer Security. That's another secure protocol. And then SSH is Secure Shell another one of those secure protocols. So these are protocols that are often used um, to manage things, uh, to transfer sensitive uh, information. Um, if you're not sure, you can go into your network device, go into your firewall, go into your router, um, and just check. You'll, most of them won't allow you to, to uncheck it, uh, meaning it's just on by default, uh, but you know, it's certainly something for you to uh, to research if you're not sure. And I put a link to a guide that we put together on how to do this. So if you're sitting there hearing some of this and you're like, okay, I keep hearing about logging into a network device, but what does that mean and how do I do it? Uh, yeah. In the chat window, you're going to find a link to a how-to guide uh, that will walk you through probably 99% of the routers out there. They all pretty much follow the exact same set of sequence. Uh, so feel free to reference that. Uh, it'll definitely help you when it comes to getting into that device for the first time if you've never done it before. Awesome. Was that the one that you wrote, Ryan? Yes, sir. Awesome. Yeah, I like that one. It's a good, good resource. All right. So that, you know, and as you're going through it, when you go through this, the first pass, answer not sure. Don't get stuck on it and, you know, um, Okay, kind of beat yourself up about it or you know get dwell on it too long just answer the questions come back to them later because you'll see when we get to the results there'll be things that the things you answered not sure you almost get like a homework list then and, and go you know find out and the re and, and i'll point point it out again the reason why these things are important is because they're your responsibility the manu it's not the manufacturer's responsibility to make sure that you change the default password these are your responsibilities so you need to know this uh, so you can protect yourself. That's the whole point. So that's a short topic. The secure gateway topic is a short topic, uh, only six questions. Uh, we could have asked 600, but let's keep it where we're at right now. So there you go. At this point, six topics down, four to go, 60% done with the S2ME assessment. Yay us, and I've mentioned this already today. Uh, We've gotten through these three topics. We took our time. Normally, you can get the, the entire thing, the entire S2ME assessment in 15 to 20 minutes. So congrats. That's part three. What's next? Part four comes tomorrow. We're going to continue on with the S2ME. Uh, it is Thursday already. I don't know if you guys lose track of days. Um, I find myself losing track of days, but tomorrow is Thursday. That's good. Uh, topic seven, backing up your data. That's really important, especially in the age of ransomware. Uh, if your data gets ransomed and you don't have a backup, you either live without the data or you pay the ransom. Both of those are terrible options. If you're backing up your data, not a big deal, and protecting those backups. Topic eight, Internet of Things. We could spend a lot of time on Internet of Things. We're not going to spend too much. We're going to go through the basics of Internet of Things and other devices. And then topic nine, physical security, um, often overlooked. Um, and I think it'll be a good topic for, for Ryan. Ryan, are you, you're, I think you're going through the, the, the session tomorrow. Did you know that? Yes, I, I, well, I, I know it now. Um, one thing you, you had mentioned, calendars. Um, so we've actually taken to, uh, we're going to implement paper calendar so we can actually start checking days off because I think this week we've each asked each other at least a thousand times what day of the week it is. So <laughs> sometimes analog is helpful, but yeah. look forward to tomorrow. Um, you guys, I've, I've posted links in the chat. We're going to leave this up for just a couple extra minutes at the close so that you have a chance to go and get those links. I'd also encourage you to go to the security studio website. Uh, we've uh, been posting a lot of resources out there. We're going to continue to do so. I'm actually just finishing up a document on how to secure your cell phone. Um, so check back often because that is going to be a place where you're going to find really helpful resources. 
um, that you can share uh, with others. We do encourage you to share this. Um, always, please do follow us on Twitter. Please email us your questions. Um, I'm so excited to see so many people showing up day over day. So thank you for participating in this. It, it really helps Evan and I um, continue to be motivated to, to produce this content for you. Yeah, and let other people know too, right? We want to spread the word. We want to help people. That's the whole, that's the reason why we do all of this. But like, like Ryan said, we'll leave it up for a few moments and then uh, we'll end it. So have a good night, everybody. Stay safe.